Um, the paper that I'm going to do studies the careers of the Reverend George Mortimer and the Reverend Dominic Blake and the professional challenges as upper Canadian clergymen during the 1830s, 1840s, and in the case of Blake, the 1850s. Um, I originally presented this paper, and this is where the idea I had came from. Um, I actually got a notice that was sent through the York University History Department's staff listserv that had come um, from Dan Graves who, about the um, Church History Society and that they were planning to have a special conference at Trinity College, um, which was last November the 1st, uh, in honor of the diocese's 175th anniversary, which was in 2014. Um, that appealed to me to do a paper there, but it, I thought at the same time, well, since we're having our 185th, why not try to do something that could be, serve both purposes? Um, so I approached Stephen at that time and said, so this paper was presented, the bulk of it first, at the, um, at the Trinity College Diocese anniversary. Um, the diocese was created in 1839 then, a date which is important to remember even as we look at Mortimer and Blake's early careers in Canada, as it was a time of administrative change both at the diocesan level and at the level of government. So there's a lot going on in terms of reorganizing structure. Previously, all of Upper Canada which had few actual parishes until the 1830s, had been part of the Diocese of Quebec. So essentially the Diocese of Quebec stretched from Quebec City all the way west. Thus, what we'll see during the course of this paper is which bishop is head of the area changes because of this. Until 1839, the Reverend John Strawn had been Archdeacon of York, but became Bishop of Toronto with the creation of the new diocese that year. Now, um, I was, in addition to trying to choose a topic for this that uh, could serve a double function and be presented for both anniversary occasions, I also wanted to do something, of course, that was in some way familiar with my own research background. Um, I was hoping to do something related to clergy and professionalization, since my PhD research focused on the professionalization of doctors in Toronto during the same period specifically the physicians managing the Toronto Lunatic Asylum, who worked as public servants for the government in this role rather than in private practice. Now many of the same issues associated with Georgian cultural ideas about work and professions, masculinity and gentlemanly conduct can be seen in my study of the asylum doctors and through the careers of Mortimer and Blake that I'm going to talk about here. Now, Toronto's population expanded rapidly in the 1830s, and we can see through this table that is showing now that it pretty much doubled every year. Um, and the British immigration, up until the 1820s, it was mainly an American loyalist population, so we might think of this as an American territory for the most part, except they had been loyal to the British government after the Revolution. In the 18, and the administrators were British, but that was a, and the military, but that was about it. Um, in the 1820s is when you started to get actual citizens immigrating into the colonies, and this really expanded in the 30s and 40s. So this growth continued across the colony into the 1850s, so that by the end of the study, the culture, politics, and administration was very different, because uh, and obviously when you have that much of a population difference, things have to be changed in some format. Now, following the rebellions in 1837 and 1838, Upper and Lower Canada were united in 1840 to form the province of Canada. So at the same time, we have the diocese creating the new um, Diocese of Toronto, we have the um, province itself also changing very much in terms of administration. So particularly in the story that I'm about to tell concerning Dominic Blake, we see his circumstances and his ability to affect change in his professional life complicated by the constant shifts in administration and leadership in the Canadian provincial government, British colonial office, and the missionary society. Despite the expanding population, immigration and significant administrative shifts and changes to occupational circumstances for most professional men as part of these realignments, a small town culture remained in Toronto and the greater York area, including Thornhill, 
particularly among elite and prof the elite and professional classes, where I would say everyone very much knows everyone else and what's going on in territory. In the case of the clergymen, because there are so few of them, especially early on, we see these ties extending across the colony as they try to establish an occupational culture, create an identity as clergy, and claim entitlement as professional men. What I often find fascinating about Upper Canadian professionals and businessmen generally in this period is the extent to which they exist both in a local small town context, so you'll see in their papers it's very much about who's doing what and who's saying what about who in this. But at the same time, they're extensive international travelers who worked very much in imperial politics as well as business and professional engagement across the transatlantic sphere. So they're doing both at the same time. George Mortimer and Dominic Blake were respectively the first and second incumbents at Holy Trinity. Promises of clerical stipends and housing provisions that were given at the time of Mortimer's and Blake's 1832 settlement, they both came at the same time to the colony, although not on the same ship, fostered expectations of ministry work that went unrealized with repercussions for their family lives and professional identities. Like so many clergy, Mortimer and Blake struggled to provide for their families such that their chosen profession partly compromised their positions as providers and heads of household. Yet their understanding of their professional struggles diverged. They had very different personalities and backgrounds. And they blamed different sources and took different courses in the pursuit of improved circumstances. George Mortimer viewed his troubles as local parish level concerns. Apparently unfazed by the low stipend given to him by the government and the mission society, and I'm going to explain this more later in the paper, he blamed his difficult material circumstances on the failure of the Holy Trinity laity to provide him with adequate housing. In contrast, Dominic Blake had a home, but found his stipend entirely inadequate, blaming systemic problems of colonial administration. He would spend two decades rallying clergy support and petitioning the missionary society British Colonial Office, and the Upper Canadian Government for retroactive remuneration at the stipend level that had been promised to him when he emigrated. While this contrast in Mortimer's and Blake's views was partly caused by their respective family circumstances, it also suggests differences in their spiritual outlook, occupational expectations, and identity as Georgian professionals, ideas which I'll explore here. Now, before I go more into Blake, I'm going to just say a little bit more about the professional culture that existed. Now, in his study of class structure in 1850s Hamilton, historian Michael Katz categorized professional men as part of what he has termed, and a lot of historians have used since, this was an 1975 study, the entrepreneurial class. This category encompassed a wide variety of occupations, but Katz referred to men who owned businesses, worked for themselves, at least in part, and or had occupations that carried respect, authority, and or autonomy. So certainly, although they were not professionals, Thornhill's Benjamin Thorne and William Parsons would have fit within this category, as together they opened a very successful dry goods business where I think the um, Food Basics Plaza is approximately now um, at Royal Orchard and Young. And Thorne had an import-export business. He bought up the mills. He was, you know, the, as we know, hence why it's named, named for him. Professional men, which, and the professions at this time included really the three categories. It would be either lawyers or clergy or physicians. Um, now, just because a man claimed an identity as one of these did not necessarily mean that everyone would think he was a great professional. Um, lawyers probably had the most, the, I would say it was the oldest of the three, had the most established status. You had to do a certain training and that was accepted. Clergy, it very much depended on what type of clergyman you were, whether you were established church or not. And physicians at this time were probably the most concerned because their training, any quack could claim that status. Now, many of them had university training and were coming from Britain from the military physicians and registered with the royal colleges. They would have been professional, but you can't quite trust who's running around the countryside at this time offering practicing. And there's, of course, competition. 
But professional men of all sorts are as much business oriented, and this was really the point that Katz was making by calling them entrepreneurial, trying to make a living as they, as the, and one of the main characteristics of this class was upward and downward social mobility, meaning that one minute you could be really successful and doing wonderfully well, and the next minute you'd be down and poor, which is really what we see happening to Benjamin Thorne. He had all kinds of success and then lost everything. Now, I've written, done a write-up for the cemetery booklet that we're having for the May 31st on him. Um, but this is what we see even happening with uh, Mortimer and Blake. In the early 19th century, professional work was culturally understood as the most respectable form of occupation, even while it wasn't the most lucrative. Most middle-class families, or aspiring to be middle-class families, tried to have at least one son enter one of the professions to elevate the family's social status and hopefully create financial stability over the long term. But professional men, of course, I just as emphasizing, did not equate to an earning potential or having money. Often these men, to sustain whatever professional endeavor they had chosen, had to supplement their income with another occupation. Either investments if they had some stability, farming was common as well, a sideline business of some sort. Um, my research has led me to conclude that the defining feature in general of what denotes a profession, past and present, is the level of autonomy and control of work that the individual has rather than education or status or money. Um, education is often a factor, but not always. Higher ranking professionals were university educated, but often families could not afford to send their children. Apprenticeships were the other common form at this time of the professional training, but it would have ranked below university. People then want to enter, want to enter a profession because of respect and status. But respect is only possible for a man if he's able to create a life that establishes him as a gentleman. And this term is tossed around a lot. And when they're criticizing each other, whether or not he did not act like a gentleman. And it doesn't just mean behavior. It's behavior is one part of it. But other factors include whether or not he's married and who he's married to and what type of family, um, who your friends are, your church affiliation, um, your reputation in the community, the number, type, and amount of voluntary activities that you're engaged with, intellectual participation, because there were a lot of um, libraries and book societies and this type of thing, um, and even down to do you drink, how much, and what. Um, at this time, actually, you probably had better identity as a professional man and in that gentlemanly category if you did drink, um, but hard liquor for, for professionals, and not beer, beer is for the working classes, and they make a very, there's a fine line between tipsy and drunk. You don't want to be drunk, but you see a lot of times people who are obviously drunk and their friends are saying, oh no, they were mere, merely tipsy. Um, so there's a lot. <laughs> George Mortimer was born in London, England in 1784 to a lower middle class family the son of a gunmaker. While Mortimer eventually entered ministry, as a youth, he apprenticed with a bookseller where he was exposed to various London intellectuals and politicians. And I think this is really where he gets his move up in the world, is through that crowd that he's hanging with. Now, these included mostly evangelical Anglicans and member of parliament Joseph Butterworth, when the British parliament was very influential with him but also he was associated with William Wilberforce and Hannah More's Clapham sect of political reformers um, who were advocating penal reform and ending slavery, and some of you may be familiar with that group, um, especially through the film Amazing Grace, it was really covered in that. These connections encouraged and aided Mortimer's entry to Queen's College, Cambridge, from which he graduated with a BA in 1811 and was ordained shortly after. The following year, he married Mary Barford, and the couple eventually had three sons and three daughters. Throughout his life, Mortimer suffered poor health with some kind of physical disability or paralysis, and it's never quite clear, left from a childhood illness that limited his work capabilities. While his brother Thomas became a priest of high standing in London, George did not have a parish of his own, at least that I can tell, until Holy Trinity Thornhill. In England, he served curacies for almost 20 years, 
The last was at Hutton in Somerset. It seems he had professional aspirations that he was never quite able to realize, and I think this is mainly due to his health, um, a pattern that continued in Upper Canada even with his own parish. Unlike Mortimer's lower middle class status, however, Dominic Blake came from an Anglo-Irish gentry family. A generation younger than Mortimer, Blake was born in 1806 in Kildigan, Ireland, southwest of Dublin, and was eldest in a family that would eventually include a brother and three sisters. Dominic's father was a Church of Ireland clergyman, an occupation that did not translate to wealth, but made him sufficiently respectable, and we're back to this respectable gentleman thing, to marry Dominic's mother, who was the daughter of a wealthy Irish parliamentarian. The Blake family's higher class status and long-term engagement in Georgian professional culture partly explains Dominic's expectations for a respectable salary in Upper Canada, but his father's death in 1823 had also put pressure on him to be successful. He and his brother William attended Trinity College at Dublin, where Dominic studied theology and graduated with a BA in 1829. William seemingly at that time did not complete his studies in which he had begun in medicine. Now later he was to become a successful, very successful lawyer in Upper Canada. Um, the brothers immigrated to Upper Canada with their family after Dominic's ordination in 1832. Now I'm also going to note just about the Blake family um, history from there, um, in addition to the member we have sitting with us. Um, but William Blake, who was the brother, um, became a lawyer member of the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada. But he was also father to um, Edward Blake, who was a lawyer but was later Premier of Ontario, and Samuel Hume Blake, who was a lawyer and a judge who became active in the evangelical movement in the Toronto Diocese late, later in the century. So they have, the Blake family has quite a lineage in the province. By the early 1830s, political disruptions in the church and of, sorry, the churches of England and Ireland were causing unstable professional circumstances for many Anglican clergy. Religious and secular movements, including Whig politics, evangelicalism, and the Anglo-Catholic Oxford movement led to divisions in the church. Problematic issues included reforms of the parish systems that existed, changes to Episcopal authority, and the Irish tithe wars which followed the passing of the 1829 Roman Catholic Emancipation Act. Now, obviously, I cannot discuss these events in detail, and I'm not an expert on them anyway. Um, we'd be here all day. But the uncertain career prospects they created led Mortimer and Blake to consider resettling in the colonies. In his late 40s, George Mortimer's primary concern was the professional futures of his sons rather than his own career advancement. He openly told friends that he had no possibility of settling his sons in Britain. Clergy salaries in Britain varied greatly depending on the location of the parish and whether or not a clergyman was beneficed, that is, is he an incumbent or not. Historian Rosemary O'Day suggests that circa 1830, 400 pounds sterling was thought to be an ideal income, although few clergy received that amount. She identifies 275 pounds as the average income for parochial incumbents and 170 for clerics. Mortimer likely had a salary in the range of 100 to 200 pounds annually using her estimates, which would have only met the basic needs of his large family. University education or even quality apprenticeships for his sons were beyond the family's means leaving education and employment in the colonies to be his, really his only hope for their future professional success. Mortimer's forthright explanation for the move, however, was criticized by some of his colleagues who believed it was not professionally becoming for a clergyman to be primarily motivated by finances and material advancement. Rather, spiritual calling should be the motive for missions. <laughs> Such attitudes about money, however, were not specific to the clergy, but characteristic of Georgian professional culture in general. Professional work was considered respectable and honorable because it focused on education, esoteric knowledge, and altruism. Financial gain suggested self-interest in hedonism, 
traits viewed as particularly inappropriate in ministry and medicine, which were supposedly centered on the spiritual and physical well-being of the practitioner's clientele. When money appeared to be directing professional activity, it was difficult to differentiate a professional's social status from that of a businessman or tradesman. Yet Mortimer argued with a friend saying, quote, beneficed clergymen and those who have only one or two children to provide for may linger in their once prosperous country, but the unbeneficed, unpatronized heads of large families must sooner or later decamp. Beginning in 1831, Mortimer inquired with clergy contacts in England, the United States, and British North America about possible placements. While no position was found, with the advice he received, Mortimer decided to go to Upper Canada without a post and later contact local authorities for placement. So there's some risk that he's assuming here. Personal need and a strong faith allowed him to undertake the risk. His letters identify him as putting his fate in God's hands. Sailing in June of 1832, he left his wife and daughters in Britain until he found secure employment, initially bringing only his sons to assist him. Now, Dominic Blake's resettlement plans appeared less risky than Mortimer's, but Blake's family status also gave him higher expectations of professional life in the colonies. Roman Catholic activism and the tithing conflicts in Ireland left Anglican clergy in poor professional circumstances some facing destitution. Career prospects were poor for the 26-year-old Blake, who as eldest son was now head of household in a professional class family. Sometime before his ordination, the Archbishop of Dublin had corresponded with John Strawn, who was then Archdeacon of York, about the availability of posts for a group of four Irish clergy with family and university connections who wished to settle in Upper Canada. An agreement was reached for these priests to be assigned to colonial parishes. A ship, the Anne of Halifax, was chartered for the July 1832 voyage of 18 friends and family, and these included Dominic and William Blake, their three sisters, their mother, and two brothers-in-law. One of the brothers-in-law was also a clergyman. Also present on this ship was Benjamin Cronin, who in 1857 was to become the first bishop of the Diocese of Huron. And because of the agreement with Strawn, Blake fully anticipated a quality placement with sufficient predictable income. Unfortunately, this expected income was not realized. Now, I'm, we'll just mention Benjamin Cronin and Arthur Palmer was one of the other clergymen that were on this ship. They will be mentioned in his case later on as we get into his fights over this. The Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, or the SPG as I will refer to it from now on, had been chartered in 1701 to serve as the Mission Society for the Church of England, organizing the establishment of the Anglican Church in the various colonies. It was an independent body but closely tied to and reliant upon the colonial office of the British government. The SPG recruited clergy to serve in colonial missions, whose stipends were then paid by the British government until 1813. So in other words, they do the recruitment, the government pays the wages. After 1813, with imperial expansion, the administration of the clergy stipends was transferred to the SPG. Gover what, but in order to provide for it, the government was providing grants to the organization of 16,000 pounds sterling a year, and the SPG set annual incumbents stipends at 200 pounds sterling. So they're paying it out, but they're getting a grant from the government in order to do so. This 200 pounds was paid to clergymen in two installments each year in January and July. To this end, colonial priests received salaries similar to British clergy. By the 1830s, however, missionary incomes became unstable and much less lucrative. Now in Upper Canada, we also have the issue of the clergy reserves. Um, clergy support was also aided by the vast clergy reserve land grants that had been provided in the 1791 Constitution Act for support of Protestant clergy, then presumed to mean Anglican. One seventh of the Crown land grants were to be reserved for church development, the building of rectories, 
for church development, the building of rectories, and generating money through the leasing of lands. And probably most of the land was used for leasing. So it would be rented out to somebody. The rent would go to the government, then the government would give it to the church, but the government is, is the center, center body in all of this. Thus, when clergy recruitment began in the 1820s, newly arriving priests were assured of some professional stability, because there was going to be some land somewhere for them. Laity support of churches was not expected at all at this point. Although as some communities became more developed, it was assumed some might voluntarily donate funds. Yet cash money was no, often not available in the colonies where debt was an endemic and necessary reality. Um, there's no real cash system at this time. There's no currency until the dollar doesn't come in until 1858. Um, a variety of currencies are circulating around. Most, it's mostly bookkeeping. There is some money, but it's not regulated. Um, and people really operate on what is called long-term credit. So if I'm Benjamin Thorne and I, or William Parsons and I have my store, I give credit to a farmer whoever, and then he's going to pay me when his crop comes in. Meanwhile, I have also got credit from my suppliers over in Britain, so I'll pay them back when the farmer pays me. And this can take a whole year or more process. So we can see where money gets very complicated. So this is not, unless they're very successful, um, and that's why you tend to get, it's like the successful thorns establishing the parishes. Now, and beginning in 1832, the British parliamentary grants to the SPG, which had been the 16,000 pounds, were phased out by the Whig government of Earl Grey over 1830 to 34, and they were stopped entirely by 1835. A letter was sent from the uh, SPG to Bishop Charles James Stewart, who was the Bishop of Quebec, which is where we were under at this time, indicating the reductions in the grants and the consequential reductions in church clergy stipends to 100 pounds by 1835. So they're just being told, your salary is going to be cut in half with costs to be borne by the upper Canadian government using the reserve funds. So your salary will be cut in half. We're not going to pay it, though. You have to look after your own through the reserve funds. Now, Stuart then, of course, sends out a circular to the clergy, and they're naturally alarmed, as we would expect. And with his support, they made the strongest remonstrances to the British colonial office about the injustice of the situation. Now, an arrangement through negotiation was reached that clergy employed before July of 1833, now we think of when Mortimer and Blake came in 1832, would receive 85% of the original stipend, which amounted to 170 pounds sterling. Now I'm gonna emphasize sterling. Upper, the British North America uses pounds Halifax as its currency, it's not sterling. And Halif sterling is worth more than Halifax, so this also becomes into the equation later on. Those arriving after July 1833 would only get the 100 pounds. It was the new rate. Yet this arrangement is far from certain. Over the next decade, many clergy found themselves receiving stipends below their entitled rate due to poor record keeping and communications, inadequate clergy reserve funds in Upper Canada, and changes to reserve fund administration, which took place within the colony through an, imper through an imperial act, which did not allow for payment of salary arrears. Given the confusion surrounding the salary payments in the early 1830s, it was unclear what level of remuneration either George Mortimer or Dominic Blake might expect to receive. Both men waited a few months for placements after they arrived. By the fall of 1832, however, Lieutenant Governor John Colborn had arranged for Mortimer to be placed at Holy Trinity. The pa parish, as we know, had been established in 1830 and previously was served by itinerant preachers in the area. In the winter of 1833, Blake was assigned to the parish of St. Anne's Adelaide, just west of Strathroy in Middlesex County near London. He served as incumbent there until Mortimer's death in 1844, which is when he moved to Thornhill. When Mortimer was to, about to be appointed to Holy Trinity, Colborne did give him a realistic picture of the salary and housing situation. Now, according to Thornhill resident Mary O'Brien in her journals, in 1831, the parishioners promised to provide a house and 90 pounds for a permanent clergyman. Yet with a realistic view of lay provisions and the stipend situation, 
Colborne told Mortimer to expect housing and 40 to 50 pounds annually from the Holy Trinity parishioners. And possibly, and he did say possibly, 100 pounds from the mission stipends. By the spring of 1833, Mortimer was receiving the 100 pound stipend and 20 to 30 pounds from pew rents. So this is not too bad. Now, technically, though, he was entitled to the 170 pound adjustment since he arrived at the church before July of 1833, but like many clergy, he was paid the lower amount. Mortimer's accommodation was poor, but with a parsonage promised to be built by the time his wife and his daughters arrived in the summer, he was content. His hopes for his sons, which had been the original purpose in him coming, were already being realized as he had been able to purchase some land for them and Strawn, John Strawn had volunteered to mentor his son Arthur who was living in York and Arthur became a priest as well and it's, it's him that the window is dedicated to in the sanctuary. Mortimer's contentment soon waned, however. Realizing his clergy income was low for a family of five to eight persons, he purchased a few acres of land to farm. As we say, he's, here's his other occupation. Taking on a second occupation, this phenomenon was no, as known by historians as occupational dualism, was common for colonial professionals who needed to supplement their income. But by 1835, the unstable upper Canadian economy led Mortimer to lose money on this endeavor. Yet he never seems to have considered asking the bishop or the government for a stipend increase viewing his maintenance as a local and parish responsibility. It became the primary source of his frustrations since housing was his most pressing need. No house was built by the time his family arrived. By August of 1833, he described them as sadly cramped together in a wooden frame house consisting of only four poorly constructed rooms that are peculiarly hot and oppressive in summer and unusually cold in winter. Lacking storage, the house was littered by boxes and trunks with an air of untidiness and discomfort. Mortimer complained that the promises to build him a small house near the church had proven so fallacious that he hardly knew how to trust his parishioners, especially as many had selfishly built elegant and spacious mansions for themselves. Now, when I said this at the Trinity Conference, Dan Graves was sitting in the front row and he says, and they still do, it's Thornhill. <laughs> Um, another four years ensued before the Holy Trinity parishioners actually completed a home for Mortimer's family. And this was only after he had approached Bishop Charles James Stewart for a new placement. It took the threat of his departure to motivate them. Mortimer's letters show a perpetual conflict between his spiritual views and his material realities, fluctuating between sentiments of trust in God's will or in his words, calm surrender to a superior power, and expressed anger and disgust at laity indifference. By 1840, he lamented that he still received no more than 140 pounds annually, though deteriorating health precluded any efforts to alter this situation. He tragically died, as we know, in June of 1844 after being thrown from his carriage on the way to Toronto. Yet by the this time, his two sons were well settled Arthur having entered ministry, and Herbert then serving as president of the Toronto Stock Exchange. So as much as Mortimer himself had a difficult time here, um, I can't help but think that at least he got his goal in the first place was met, um, and his two sons did well when they were here. Now by the time Dominic Blake took over from Mortimer at Holy Trinity, he was already embroiled in a battle for proper stipend pay with arrears dating to his Adelaide appointment in the winter of 1833. Although Blake was promised 200 pounds when he immigrated, he only received, he only received the reduced 100 pounds meant to apply to clergy beginning after July of 33, same as Mortimer did. Documents in Blake's collected correspondence indicate that he struggled to provide for his eight family dependents in the isolated community of Adelaide, which I think was compared to Thornhill, was even more in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Unlike Mortimer, he did not engage in occupational dualism. A friend supporting his case later mused that, quote, had Blake given his time to farming, he would have at least been able to live, but he gave his whole life energy to his profession. And I could never quite tell whether this was a criticism or a compliment or some combination of both. Whether the decision on Blake's part was indic indicative of dedication and professional sacrifice or was simply foolish and stubborn is debatable. 
but from Mortimer's experience, farming might not have helped anyway. At least 20 clergy were affect, affected by these low stipends, although they seem to have been unaware of the July 1833 exemption policy until the late 1830s. In 1838, Benjamin Cronin and Arthur Palmer, who had come with Blake on the ship, became aware of this and made successful appeals to the Upper Canadian government for retroactive payment on the reserve funds. Blake got wind of this and began zealously his, he, began, he zealously began his own appeal, but found himself constantly blocked by bureaucracy. He began writing numerous officials locally and in Britain, and these included the Lieutenant Governor or Governor General, um, bishops, colonials, the Colonial Secretary, and clergy in Ireland and London, trying to make his claims or at least get support board of letters for these claims. Information about the status of his position and circumstances comes out through the various correspondence. He was told Cronin and Palmer had been successful because their names appeared on an 1834 list of Upper Canadian clergy stipends. His did not, something that was later found out to be a clerical error, and I thought I just <laughs> liked the pun when I was doing it. Um, he was told he needed proof of his employment date and stipend. The next few years were spent gathering support letters from his friends and officials particularly attesting to the time of his original employment and his professional character. So in other words, he needs professional character just to emphasize that he's not just some money-grubbing guy going off trying to get funds. Yet the case was determined to be the responsibility of a governor, which proved problematic during the Union of Upper and Lower Canada, which is taking place all at the same time. So we have the diocese reorganizing, the government reorganizing, so everything he's doing is getting lost in the shuffle. By 1843, when things are starting to calm down a little, Governor General Charles Bagot had taken charge and it was settled on paper the next year. Blaker, however, was told to approach the SPG, the Mission Society, for the payments, despite the fact that had, way back when, the Mission Society was no longer having any jurisdiction over stipends and had said, no, these are gonna be paid out of the reserve funds. So he still isn't paid. Now, by this time, Blake is both furious and frustrated, and the problems made him all the more determined to ensure he got justice. He now sought not only the retroactive compensation of 170 pounds, but also the extra 30 pounds of the 200 he'd originally been promised. And the other thing that comes into the equation here is exchange rates. Um, as I was reading through Blake's documents, at some point, probably towards the 1850s, it became kind of obvious to me that he has received some kind of payment, but there's an argument, well, I only got this much, and I got this much, and I, can't, I couldn't quite figure it out until I thought, I think there's two exchange rates, so I had to go and do a search of actual what exchange rates were, and it turns out there's a bookkeeping rate from translating um, sterling to pounds Halifax, and then there's a foreign exchange rate ba based on bullion, which is what Blake wants, but he's only getting the bookkeeping rate. So this is another, he's shortchanged in a number of ways. He petitioned to receive these amounts either in pounds sterling or the proper foreign exchange rate. So he's like, I don't care if it's sterling or Halifax, but I want it at the right rate. Compensation had been offered to clergy, of course, at the lower bookkeeping rate. Now, what I think is most did get those, like even Cronin and Palmer, probably got the lower rate. But I think there comes a point at which you just take it and then forget the aggravation of trying to go after the rest of it. Professionally, though, Blake's focus on money and self-interest, because when he um, writes his friends, he's writing all over to his various friends to get support. Many of them are sympathetic because they understand how he feels, but at the same time, there's a bit of, you need to let this go. After a point, you're not only making yourself look bad and against the other clergy, because he's got a bit of a self-interest streak to what he, the way he approaches this, but you're making us as a group look bad and causing problems. Now, at one level, he seemed a bit obsessive. It was also important to remember that he was accustomed in Ireland to being in the upper ranks of society um, via his father and Trinity College Dublin. And more importantly, salaries had implications, though, that are not only lifelong for the clergymen, because they affect their pensions as well as their actual salary, 
but also widow pensions were affected in the event of their death. Uh, widow pensions were awarded at an annual amount of half the original salary and could also be claimed by their mothers. Um, and we see this actually occur with Blake, whose elderly mother outlived him later on. Tensions with colleagues began to emerge as he wrote these different friends seeking support for his case. They reminded him that most of them had cases pending of this nature and were all in the same position. For a Georgian professional, this obsessive focus on money and self-interest is not considered gentlemanly. In 1845, a clergy friend in Dublin wrote a lengthy letter to Lord Stanley, who was the colonial secretary. And on a trip to Britain, his brother William, now William was actually going through a period of very ill health, so he'd taken kind of a sabbatical leave in Europe, um, trying to seek treatments. But as part of this, he went over to London to specifically try and get help for his brother's case. He made, so he makes efforts to speak to as many government and church officials in London as possible to rally support for his brother's case. By 1849, Blake and Cronin placed much of the blame on John Strawn, who had, much, who had control, they saw as much control of diocesan funds, and apparently did not prioritize the stipend arrears to other clergy. Strawn's pay apparently was also being adjusted through all of this, and given that as bishop he already had a higher salary than they did, his unwillingness to improve Blake's and the others' situations did not go over well with them. Benjamin Cronin commented to Blake in a personal letter that he believed Strawn was controlling the clergy funds and essentially keeping them away from those claiming retroactive salary payments. This situation caused a rift between the bishop and the Irish contingent, as I'm thinking of them, because a lot of them had come on that ship or were associates, and of which Blake and Cronin were both part. Stratton distributed circulars publicly chastising these clergymen around the diocese and gave speeches which apparently made the contents of the circulars look mild. Mm -hmm. Strawn had no tolerance for the political activists of these radicals, as he put it. By the 1850s, many stipend claims remained unresolved. Blake was awarded arrears at the proper foreign exchange rate sometime early in the decade, which he seemingly used to buy a large piece of property near Thornhill. Yet he still pushed on for the extra 30 pounds, demanding a provincial inquiry with a, which did eventually occur in 1857. The unresolved stipends became a motivating factor for the creation of a diocesan synod in the early 1850s. Now, we had a discussion of this at the Trinity College conference because there was um, a paper was presented from the sort of strong point of view of the creation of the diocesan synod. Strawn wanted a synod, but not for the same reasons as this other group did. This other group was more after their occupational situation. Dominic Blake took a central role in the synod project, which was in, I think, the unofficial synod was in 1853, and the first official one was 1854. He wanted salaries to be placed at the forefront of the, of the discussions, arguing that it was the want of an assured and respectable income that had left many clergy seriously crippled in their means and also was discouraging young men from even entering the profession. Dominic Blake died tragically of a heart attack at Trinity College after giving a speech or a sermon, I'm not sure which it was, in 1859. A letter from John Strawn to Blake's mother shortly after his death concerning the possible widow's pensions a addresses this whole concern of what claims she has and is actually quite sympathetic from Lake, uh, from, um, I'm trying to say Strawn, in this thing. So we see kind of, I think his argument was very much with Blake, not with the family, and certainly he's taking on his role as bishop in this as well, um, but he's offering her whatever support he can give her. Now this last slide was a little controversial when I did it at the, I used the NCD for this, um, Dave Robinson was there and he was quite shocked that an academic would use NCD, but anyway, that, there's a whole other discussion around that. But it's clear from this discussion that the Holy, Tr the Holy Trinity's first two incumbents could not have been more different in their personality, professional outlook, and sp spiritual orientation. Seemingly accustomed to lower pay and struggle, George Mortimer's focus was entirely centered on the well-being of his family. The comfort and future welfare of his wife and children directed his life decisions and professional endeavors. He only expressed anger or frustration when he felt others were causing his family unnecessary suffering. 
For himself, he adopted a strong evangelical notion of providence and God's will having placed him in whatever circumstances he found himself. In Dominic Blake's case, family welfare almost certainly directed his initial petitions for salary comp compensation. Yet professional expectations that his occupation should yield a higher level of social status and financial stability gave him little tolerance for the poorly developed government and bookkeeping systems of Upper Canada and the colonial office. It led him to focus on canon law, doctrine, and the pursuit of justice that at times led him to have a negative professional image, but that was key for the development of the synod system in Canada. Together, the stories of Mortimer's and Blake's experiences as clergymen suggest the myriad of struggles these early men faced in a culture that frowned upon professional demands for proper financial remuneration. <laughs>